meeting and bring our time to a close, we will look at his disciples. And in chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two men, two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and uh, left the ship and their father and followed him. I will just finish there at that little, uh, just that little portion of God's word this morning. And as I was reading this portion of scripture, uh, I began to think about um, those that go fishing, people that, that enjoy fishing. And even myself, whenever we were small, we used to come down to Port Rush. We would have stayed in the caravan down there. And then uh, in the evening time, probably with, with dad and a couple of my brothers, maybe we would have went fishing across on the, the rocks there just around Port Rush or maybe in the harbor. Um, and if any of you are, are fishermen or fisherwomen, you'll know what fishing is like. Um, sometimes you can go there and you can catch fish all day, one after the other. You just put your rod, put your, your bait in, out comes a fish all day, fish, fish, fish. Another time you can go and you can catch nothing at all. You can stand there all day and you wonder where have all the fish gone? What's happening? There's nothing going on here. This is, this is terrible. Uh, sometimes you can go and you can watch everybody else catching fish except you. I've seen that happen too, where this man over here is catching fish and somebody else, but you're standing there and there's nothing happening. And maybe no one was catching any fish at all. And maybe sometimes it would take hours just standing there fishing, fishing, fishing before you would even get one bite. Uh, and so there's always these different scenarios and you never really know what it's going to be like whenever you go out. But even as we look upon that lesson of of going out fishing, there's just a couple of things I jotted down that even that you can learn from that. And first of all, you need to have your, your line in the water. That's the first thing about fishing. There's no point in, in getting there and then just sitting down in your seat with the rod beside you, but the, there's, there's, no, there's no fishing line in the water. You need to have your nets or your line in. You need to use the correct bait if you're going to catch or attract the fish. There's no point tying a stone onto the end of a rock or on, on, a rock onto the end of a, a line and throwing it in. It's not going to attract the fish. They need to have the right bait. There's no guarantee, even at that, that you're going to catch anything at all. And, and fourthly, you must have patience. If you don't have patience, then you're not going to make a good fisherman. As I was thinking about those different points as well, we can apply even that to the Christian life whenever we think about um, fishing. Because if we want to be able to reach people for Christ, we need to have our fishing, net, our, our, our fishing nets out. In other words, we need to be actively working for the Lord. Just like the fisherman goes to the, the side of the river, to the side of the sea, if he wants to be able to catch his fish, he has to put his net out. He has to put his, his fishing line in. If we want people to be impacted with the gospel, we need to be teaching them the right gospel, not just ear tickling. And so in other words, when we use the correct bait to catch the fish, we need to be able to use the correct form of the gospel in order for lives to be changed. And then also thirdly, we have to realize that even though we've done all of these things, we may not still see people coming to the Lord in great numbers, but also to remember that it's not our job to convert, that that belongs to the Lord. So there's just a few thoughts as we start just about fishing and about lessons that we can learn from Scripture. And when we read through this, this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 4, we wonder to ourselves, why did Jesus call fishermen? He's walking along, it says, He walked by, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Well, I suppose really at, at that time in those days, that was the normal job of the day. That's where the, the area where they worked in, that was their employment. They were fishermen. They were just normal, hard-working men of the area. They were seeking to do a hard day's work. They were seeking to provide for their families. 
They were just simple men who were doing their day's work. I suppose also you could say that a fisherman is a a hands-on kind of person. They are in the middle of the activity. They're casting their nets. They're busy working on the boat. They're getting the job done as they go about their, their daily tasks. They went quietly about their work. They probably had to go out in all kinds of difficult weather conditions, but they still had the determination to keep on going. They were willing to get their hands dirty in order to complete the task. And really it tells me simply that God uses normal people. In those days when we think about maybe um, back in, in, in years gone by and maybe it was the idea that it was only educated people who could be involved in the things of God, people who were studying and people who were always in the books and always um, learning and so on. But as Christians, as people, God requires us all to be involved in the Great Commission, not just those that have great minds, not just those that have great education behind them, but all of us as Christians have a part, have a part to play. Regardless of the task that you're involved in, God can use you These men probably could have turned around and said that they weren't up to the task. They were just simply fishermen. What did they really know about going out and being fishers of men? But they followed him straight away. Verse 20 says, And straightway left their nets and followed him. Maybe in today's world, a lot of times what happens is that uh, Church folk and Christian people, they assign the role of spreading the gospel to maybe the pastor or to the missionary or maybe to the the elders or the deacons of the church. And yes, of course, they maybe do have a more focused role within the congregation, but we need to remember that each one of us has that responsibility as a Christian, that we are the ones who go out and tell people about the gospel, tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be standing in the front in a pulpit. We don't have to be on the street corner preaching. We don't have to be in in any of these places of public notice, but yet simply in the quiet place, whether it be with your neighbor or your family or your friend, just simply living before people, showing them God's love through your actions. Each one of us, in that sense, needs to be casting our nets out in the area that we work in and waiting to see what we will catch Are you willing to use the net of the gospel in your workplace or in your home or in your church? Because that's the task that God has given us. This week coming in, we have another opportunity, as it were, to cast out our nets into this local community with the boys and girls. The opportunity is there for to, to bring those people in who maybe wouldn't normally be in a church and to be able to share God's love with them. Are we educated people? Are we specially trained for all of these things? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Some of us are maybe more educated than others, but at the end of the day, we all have the same desire and the same passion, and that is to spread the love of God to the boys and girls. And that's simply it. What we have received from the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, we want to share with them. Uh, And not just the boys and girls, but every day with everybody that we meet. Whenever, um, whenever I was in Bible college, probably close to 10 years ago now, we had a program there, a, a class session called Each One, Reach One, Each One, Teach One. And the, the theory behind that was the, the multiplication principle. And in this study, basically, they, they worked it out that if you were to witness to one person and that person trusted Christ, and then you taught that person to witness to one person, And you kept on doing this every time, one person and that person was witnessing one one on one. After 20 years, over one million people would be reached with the gospel. And it's amazing to think about that, just how you simply just talking to one person and that person talks to one and the whole thing begins to spread out. Very soon, millions of people would have been reached with the gospel. Obviously, of course, when we reach people and we talk to people, not everybody's going to get saved. That, this principle is simply uh, in, the, in the kind of the ideal world. But obviously, it doesn't happen like that. But think of the potential that there is simply by just reaching one other person with the gospel. And so we, we have two ways that we can live on this earth as Christians. 
We can be someone who is happy just to be on our way to heaven. We can have no thought for others and no other thought for how we can live as as Christians and, and how we can be of use to the Lord. Or we can live as a Christian who loves the Lord and His Word and wants to reach others with that same message. As we look look at this verse, we we see a couple of words that we can draw out and and use maybe to help us. First of all, in verse 19, it says, follow me. Verse 19 said, he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The Lord Jesus is our master this morning. That's who we follow. He is our leader. He is our heavenly father. He asks us to follow him so that we may stay close to him and learn more from him each day. And then through that, then also we can be more attentive to his will. Sometimes Christians in today's modern society are happy to call themselves Christians, but maybe have little interest in actually following what Christ wants for their lives. Maybe they have their own agenda They fit God and try and fit God around it. But instead, we must place God at the center of our lives, follow after him, and put the things of our lives in second place to God. These men didn't say, yes, we'll follow you, Lord, but let me do this, let me do that, let me do the other thing. It says in verse 20, straightway they left their nets and followed him. You know, the act of following someone is actually a very secure place to find yourself. Whenever you follow someone else, you're putting your trust in them that they know what they are doing and what they're, where they're going and so on. Whenever uh, I was in Portugal, we used to occasionally, we had to go to Lisbon. And Lisbon is a huge city. And me as a country boy coming from Cookstown, not used to driving around cities at all. Even Belfast is, is too complicated for me at times, but in Lisbon, uh, there's just lanes and junctions and bridges and and highways and all sorts of things. But my colleague, Geraldo, he'd been there for 20 years. He was whizzing this way and that way and driving here and driving there. Um, And so anytime I went to Lisbon, if we were were in two vehicles, I always made sure to follow Geraldo because he knew exactly where he was going. Um, for me, it was just too stressful, but yet I found that security and been able to follow him because he knew exactly what turns to make at the right time, and I didn't have to think about that. We can think of other situations where people follow others. It may be an apprentice mechanic who is following in the way of a more senior mechanic who learns how to fix things. Maybe you're a junior doctor who is learning uh, and following after more experienced doctors in order to learn more about the work that they do. And so too, also then, whenever we follow after Christ, we depend on him day by day and hour by hour. He directs our footsteps. And so when the Lord Jesus says, follow me, we're following after him day by day, hour by hour. We're putting our full trust in him. We're placing our security in him and that we know that as we follow him, we may not know where we are going, But when we follow him, we know that we have security, that he knows the way. Secondly, we see it says that I will make you fishers of men. I wonder as people this morning, do we know how to fish for men by our own, in our own ideas, in our own strength? Maybe yes, maybe we have ideas, maybe no, maybe we have no clue. Ultimately, I don't think that we really do know. But here we see in this verse that Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. You see, these men were not yet what Jesus wanted them to be. But also God is not bound by who we are. He is able to take each one of us and turn us into the type of servant that he wants us to be. These men were by no means the elite of society. They were just simple men out doing their day's work. But the message here is that when God begins a work in our lives, he has the power and the ability to transform us and use us for his glory. We may not have a university education, but God can able, and God is able to use us and help us to study the Bible and teach others. 
We may not have skillful hands, but God can take us and use us and help us to build churches around the world. We may not have the gift of music, but God can still use us to lead people in praise to him. He promised to make these men fishers of men. If God has a task for us to do, you can be sure that he will enable us to be able to do it. Have you identified a task in your life that God wants you to do? He will give you the ability to do it. Trust him this morning. I know sometimes when you're standing maybe on a doorstep and you've knocked that door and you're waiting for someone to answer and you're going to give them a tract, it can be a little bit daunting, but God will give you the strength. Or maybe someone has asked you to take a Bible lesson um, in the Holiday Bible Club and you're thinking, I don't know if I can do this, but God will give you the strength. Maybe there's a person in work that you want to talk to and you've been meaning to share your faith with for months or maybe years even, And you just don't know how you can overcome that fear, but God will help you to do it if we trust in him. God has been able to use people down through the years and and people who have had no training or no gifts perhaps, and yet God has taken them and turned their lives around. Even in our own mission, and we've been speaking a lot about recently, Dr. Bill Woods, who left Northern Ireland as a man who had no qualifications of any kind except a simple, basic education. But God was able to use him to become a medical doctor in Brazil and to be able to help in the eradication of leprosy. That's what God can do. God can take people into darkest places where there are very, very few other Christians and he can help them to be a missionary there, to be able to share God's love with the people, to be able to help people, to be able to do different things uh, in his name. Not through their own strength, but because they followed Christ And he was the one that that was able to help them. He was the one that enabled them to do it. God made them into what he wanted them to be. So then what is this process then? How as we as Christians, how can we reach out to other unsaved people? What is it that we can do in order that others might see the love of God and respond to it? Well, firstly, we can be an influence to others by our attitudes in our attitude in life. It says in 1 Peter 3.15 that we should always be ready to give an account and to give an answer for the hope that is within you. People should see that there is something different within you and this in turn should cause them to ask the question, why is this so? We've heard it many times, perhaps and maybe even in your own workplace, you'll know that maybe people have labeled you, oh, he's the good living one or, or she's the one that goes to church or or he's this, or he's that, but people know whenever they they see that we live differently, maybe even without us having to say anything, people will know that we are Christians and that we follow after Christ. Through this, we have the opportunity then to share the gospel with the people. If we turn over, I think it's at Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke uh, chapter 5, I think again it talks about... um, the fishermen following Jesus. Luke chapter 5, verse 5 says, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So we see here that these men have been working hard. They've been working all through the night. And you wonder maybe why why do they fish through the night? And, and if you do maybe just a, a bit of research and you look into why maybe people fish at night, it's possible that at night time fish are, are drawn uh, towards the nets by maybe the lights of boats and so on and, and different things that are happening. Maybe the men had a, a small, in those days probably not a torch or an LED lamp, but they would have had maybe a, a, some kind of a, a lantern. And the fish maybe were drawn to the light of the boat and into the, towards the nets which had been cast out. And maybe at nighttime fishing would have been more effective because of this. And just as I was thinking about the idea that the fish are drawn towards the light, you know, as Christians, we should be reflecting the light of the Lord Jesus to the people around us so that they are attracted not to us, but to the Savior from where that light comes from. Does your light for Jesus shine brightly throughout the week? 
when you go to the office or to the classroom or to the shops, do people recognize you by your attitude that you're different? Or maybe you're just a Sunday-only Christian. When you switch on that light, the Christian light, to come to church and then you switch it off again whenever you leave the meeting. But this is our task as Christians on earth, is to shine forth the light of the gospel and not only to love, ourselves, love God for, for ourselves and also not only just to love God, but also to have that love for others as well and share that light that as other people see us, that they will realize that we are Christians. We don't just want to be Sunday-only Christians. We don't just want to have a lovely time here together on a Sunday morning and then go home again and back to our lives, but we want to be laborers hard at work in the Great Commission for the Lord. We can also be an influence to others through our actions. We know that as believers, our salvation doesn't depend upon our works. We know that, but yes, as Christians, good works should begin to flow from us as we seek to serve and please God. Unfortunately, in today's world, Christians are known maybe for the things that they have maybe done wrong that doesn't bring glory to the Lord. No doubt there have been many scandals in with which Christians have been involved in, and that only serves perhaps to label us as hypocrites. But we need to get back to the place where our actions reflect our sincerity for God. It's the small actions that maybe go unnoticed by many that will ultimately reach someone for God. They can see that little glimmer of the gospel shining forth in the actions that you have shown towards them. And through that, it sparks that interest within their life that there's maybe more to all of this than just a simple friendship and a simple uh, love for people, but that there's a, a deeper meaning behind it all. Can you think of something maybe you did over the recent days which may have been a sacrifice for you, but it demonstrated love to the person that you were in contact with? Sometimes it's a sobering thought as we look back over a week and we, we start to realize the number of potential opportunities that we have had to serve, but we simply missed it because we just weren't in this constant attitude of wanting to serve others by our actions. We should always be thinking about what we can do to show the love of Christ to others. Thirdly, we can be an influence to others through our words. Obviously, one of the most useful tools that we have in being able to uh, be an influence is through the spoken word. As we've said earlier, and Peter it reminds us that we should always be ready to give that, that defense. We should always be ready to speak for the Lord, be able to share about him, to be able to share what he has done in our lives. And sometimes it, it is necessary for us to give a verbal defense of the scriptures. Of course, we, we know today's society that uh, it isn't a very acceptable thing to speak out in defense of the gospel. It seems perhaps that at every turn the, the, the Christian viewpoint is being put down uh, the media pick up on things that Christians are doing and they criticize straight away and so on. Uh, it's maybe not any longer politically correct to speak to others about the gospel. But again, if we look through Scripture, none of these things are really anything new. We look through the book of Acts and we see several times how the apostles were told to be quiet and were told never to speak of these things again concerning Jesus. But it says there in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, that following these different uh, confrontations, that they could do nothing else, only speak about him more. And that's what it is to be able to have a defense for the Lord Jesus Christ. Although we, the world will put us down, but yet it encourages us just to speak more for him. Whenever we begin this life as Christians, we, we do so in the knowledge that there needs to be a willingness to leave aside our own personal desires um, our own goals and our own priorities. We don't know where Jesus will lead us whenever we become a Christian. We don't know how our lives will change whenever that happens. We don't know what things he will ask us to turn away from or to leave behind. Maybe uh, for those that are involved in mission work, it means leaving family and friends behind to go to other countries to serve him. Other missionaries have traveled the globe in order to bring the good news to the people. 
Others are maybe in Bible college at this present time and they're not sure maybe where the Lord is going to lead them. Uh, but no doubt it, it calls for that willingness to leave aside their own desires and their own plans for the future to be able to follow after what the Lord wants them to do. But what about you this morning? As I ask the question, where is your journey with the Lord taking you? Are you prepared to go? Perhaps this journey is leading you on a path just simply to witness to your neighbor that you live beside. Will you invite them to church? Will you offer them that gospel tract? Or maybe you will be led to share the gospel with your colleagues at work. Are you prepared to take that young man or that young woman that you live beside on your heart and pray that God would open up their hearts to the gospel? Are you prepared to share with them and then in time disciple them through many long hours and maybe difficult topics that they have to deal with? Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He will do the work. All we need to do is to be willing and available and follow him. You know, whenever we think about um, fishing as well, and, and as we've talked already about how you can go and you can be a fisher, you can go out and, and fish, but you mightn't catch anything. You don't know where the fish are. And there's all kinds of sophisticated devices nowadays. You go out on, the, on a boat and the radar, the sonar will tell you where the fish are at. But as Christians, we need to be where the fish are, so to speak. The reality is that every fisherman knows that the fish don't jump into the boat by themselves. And if they do, it's a very, very rare occurrence. The story is told of a man who went fishing in an abandoned fish farm. He was fishing in the lake, but it didn't contain any fish. A passerby said to him, excuse me, sir, it's no good fishing there because you won't catch anything. But the fisherman replied and said, yes, but I really want to persevere here until I finally catch a fish. You see, the man hadn't realized that he was fishing in the wrong place. And so we need to understand, first of all, how fish act. And I'm, I'm kind of using fish as an analogy here. But one of, the things that, one of the things that happens as we grow up in our Christian lives is perhaps that we stop spending as much time with non-believers and we begin to obviously build our friendship groups around those that are Christians and, and rightly so we should have Christian friends and brothers, Christian brothers and sisters but what happens is that as we spend more and more time with our Christian friends and Christian groups we begin to leave those people to the side that maybe aren't yet Christians and we lose, we lose focus on, on who is actually lost. It means that we need to take time to build relationships with those people that are unbelievers in order that we might build bridges of friendships and trust so that in time we can effectively share the gospel. You know, sometimes we, we hold maybe gospel missions and so on and, and we open up our church and we, we have a, a mission, but this, it's, it's all the Christian people who are sitting in the mission. Where are they unsaved? They're not coming in. We're not inviting them in. And, and in that sense, we're, we're fishing in the wrong place because we're preaching the gospel to the converted. But we need to be out there in those places where we know that we will encounter unsaved people where the gospel is going to have the, the greatest effect. We need to be willing to use different strategies. A good fisherman will always be willing to try a different approach if he isn't catching a fish. He will try maybe a different type of bait or he will fish at a different depth, or so on. Of course, many, many people have different ideas of how, about, how we can go about reaching people with the gospel. And different people require different approaches. And we as a church, and we as, as God's people, we need to be prepared to try those different approaches. Also, we need to learn how to wait, as we've already learned. Fishing is all about patience. George Muller was a great man of faith who lived many years ago in England. He shared the gospel many times with a friend, but that friend just simply refused to come to Christ. Muller spent 52 years praying for that man and witnessing to him, but he never seen that man converted. Eventually, Muller died, and at his funeral, that man heard the gospel preached one more time, 
And it was at that funeral that he trusted Christ. Never give up on someone. 52 years of prayer brought that man to conversion. So can I ask the question this morning, what are you fishing for? Have you cast your nets out, uh, your net of the gospel out this morning and waiting to see who will respond? Or is your fishing equipment packed up safely in the house and you haven't been fishing for some time? The Lord wants us out there reaching people and, and reaching those around us. There are plenty of opportunities to serve the Lord. I trust you will see how you can play a vital role in this great commission of the Lord that all the gospel may be reached with the glorious message of the gospel. And as we think about those things, we, again, as we think about the Holiday Bible Club, we do think about the boys and girls in the area. And those are the people, those are the people that we want to reach this week, them and their parents and their families. We want to see them coming in and we want to see their lives changed. We realize that uh, maybe perhaps they're not just going to walk in here. We maybe expect that they'll just appear we know there's been a lot of groundwork done. There's been many invitations that have been given out. Um, there's been a thousand invitations go around the local homes. Three of the different schools in the local areas have agreed to give the invitation to all of their pupils. So that's over roughly about another thousand pupils that have got the invitation through their mobile, through the app. And so we have cast our nets this morning in the, as a church. And we are looking to the Lord this week to see what he is going to do. And so I trust that, that it will be a good week of outreach and that God will really bless in every way. Let's just pray before we close with our final hymn. Lord, we thank you again for 